Hi everyone, uh, this is Rex Jerry of Jerry.com and BeginningLinks.com. Today's lecture is called AND.Basics.0, the AND stands for Android, Getting Started Developing Android Apps on Fedora GNU Linux. You can see this lecture in its original context at Jerry.com forward slash node forward slash 28. Okay, we're going to hit a lot of objectives today. This is going to be a pretty long lecture, but it's going to be very good. It's going to be worth it, especially if you're looking to um, start creating Android apps uh, using a GNU Linux system. Uh, I've been a long-time Fedora user, so of course I'm going to do the tutorial in Fedora. But a lot of the principles are probably applicable to any uh, GNU Linux distribution that you use, such as Ubuntu, Linux Mint, etc., etc. Okay, the objectives we're going to hit, we're going to discuss Android and Java. We're going to discuss OpenJDK. We're going to discuss Android.apk files. We'll discuss the Android Security Sandbox. We'll discuss Android Application Components. We'll discuss the Android Manifest file. We'll demonstrate the Android Development Tools, which are abbreviated ADT, and we'll demonstrate Eclipse. And then we'll show solutions to various installation problems that I had when I was trying to get my setup up and running. Okay, uh, let's jump right into it. Android and Java. Android is a very popular uh, Linux-based operating system for mobile devices. Uh, there was an announcement the other day that Android has hit 900,000 activations per day. So you can imagine how popular Android is right now. It's developed by the Open Handset Alliance under uh, Google, Google's leadership. The Open Handset is, Alliance is an alliance of, um, it's constantly growing. I think the latest numbers is more than 80 companies. Uh, that have input into developing Android. Android was purchased by Google in 2005, and uh, most of the Android source code is released under the open source Apache license. Uh, the one exception, of course, is the Linux kernel is licensed under the GPL license version 2. Okay, Android and Java continue. Java uh, is a programming language developed by a man named James Gosling while he worked for Sun Microsystems back in the early 90s. Uh, Android applications are written in the Java programming language. Java syntax is very similar to C and C++ syntax, so if you're a C or C++ pro programmer, um, Java will, will be very easy for you, it'll become like second nature. Um, I started out C++ and uh, I'm still primarily a C++ programmer, but uh, I'm learning Java and I find it to be, you know, it's so similar that it's, it's almost like a dialect uh, by completely a, a, a separate language. Uh, Java has a simpler object, object model than C or C++, so you know, if you're used to um, creating objects in C++, C++ specifically, uh, you, you might find Java a little bit easier. Uh, Java uses virtual machines, so Java is designed such that you write it once, and in theory, it should run the same pretty much on every platform. So you'd have a virtual machine you know, running in GNU slash Linux, a, a different virtual machine running in Windows, a different virtual machine running in Solaris or um, you know, one of the free BSDs, open BSD, uh, Mac, and in theory, you write the code once and it should run the same. Okay, discuss open JDK. Now, I come from an open source community, so I always try to find the open source, uh, you know, free software uh, solution if I can. You know, I, I prefer not to buy software. I prefer not to use proprietary software. Now, I will buy software if that's the best solution, but I try to look for the open source alternative first. So running Android development tools requires a Java virtual machine. Um, since I'm from the open source, uh, FOSS, free software communities, uh, this naturally led me to OpenJDK. Because I'm a GNU Linux user, most GNU Linux uh, distributions come with a version of OpenJDK installed. So you know, the preferred method for you doing Java programming on almost any GNU Linux distribution is to use OpenJDK. OpenJDK is an open source implementation of the Java Platform Standard Edition, which is the one that's uh, released pretty much under a GPL license. Okay, OpenJDK continued. The latest version of OP OpenJDK as of today, uh, I'm recording this on June 17, 2012, is JDK version 7. Most GNU Linux distributions use OpenJDK as their default Java SE environment. Fedora 17, which is what I'm currently using, just came out a few weeks ago, uh, comes with OpenJDK 1.7. I've been able to compile and run Java code with OpenJDK. I haven't had any problems. So for the near future, I see no need to install the proprietary Oracle JDK. That Oracle JDK, the source code is not available for you. You can't analyze it, so you're pretty much 
trusting that uh, Oracle is going to do the right thing, which I, I don't frankly trust them to do. So I, I prefer using open source, open JDK. Uh, if, I remember, if I remember correctly, Red Hat is one of the primary proponents of OpenJDK. They're kind of the ones that kind of push the project to start. So, you know, I use a Red Hat derived product in Fedora, so I, I really just trust OpenJDK a lot. Okay, discuss Android.apk files. The APK stands for Android Application Package File. It's the method of distributing and installing programs on Android. It contains a manifest file, a resource file, and other files that describe parts of an Android program. Android developers can register on Google Play. Uh, that used to be called uh, Android Market. It just recently got named uh, Google Play. Uh, once you as a developer have developed your application, you can upload the associated APK file to Google Play. Now, of course, you don't have to use Google Play. Uh, you know, On almost any Android phone, the, the owner has the option of saying, uh, can I install non-market apps on this phone? And then they can just install any, you know, any file, any Android program out there. So Google Play is just a nice centralized way of distributing your applications that's supported by Google. And if you want your app to be paid, you know, Google will actually collect the money for you and then they'll distribute it minus, uh, if I remember correctly, for Google Play, it's a 30% fee that Google will take. So you get 70% of the money that your app makes. The end user uh, then downloads and installs the Android application onto their device, either for free or after paying a fee. So if you decide that you don't want to use Google Play, you want to just distribute your app yourself, you can collect money for it if you want to, but of course that's going to be completely on you. Uh, Google's not going to do it for you. Okay, discuss the security sandbox. Now Android is based on Linux or GNU slash Linux for those of us in the free software community. Like I said, I consider myself both part of the free software community and the open source. I respect both perspectives, but I, I'm more on the free software side, so you hear me say good news slash Linux a lot. Okay, each application on an Android device is assigned its own unique Linux-based user ID for the duration of each program run. Those of you that are familiar with Linux, you, you know that. You, you're very familiar with um, uh, user IDs, usually GUID. So a user ID might be something like 100 or 200 or 300, uh, 458, whatever. While that application is running, it kind of has a lock on that user ID, so it only it has access to whatever resources are associated with that user ID. So if you have a program on your phone called uh, NavFree USA, while NavFree USA is, is, is running, it has certain privileges associated with, it user, with its user ID, and it can't do anything that's outside of the boundaries of what it's supposed to do. Okay, the privileges of each program are based on its user ID, so a program cannot gain access to resources that it should not have access to. Android application APK files must be signed with a certificate. This private key for this certificate is held by the program, program developer, and it identifies the application's author. That's very important for security purposes. If somebody releases a piece of software that's malware, that's stealing people's passwords and people's private information, there's a private key in there that traces it directly back to whoever authored that uh, application. And of course, that, uh, that author will be banned from the Google Play Marketplace, so they can, you know, they can no longer uh, ever develop apps for the Google Play Marketplace, which is a very good security feature. The Android manifest.xml file is used to set many of the Android program permissions. Now, in this, in this tutorial today, we won't actually write our first Android application. I'm going to show you how to set up the environment. So I won't really show you the Android manifest, uh, Android manifest file today, but uh, that'll be something for a future tutorial. Okay, discuss the components of uh, Android applications. Okay, there's some major components. There's four major ones. An activity. An activity is just kind of an instance of a program. It's a single, single screen and it's associated user interface. A service is a program that runs in the background performing tasks for the main program that are typically invisible to the end user. This is all familiar stuff. If you're used to using uh, GNU slash Linux or Windows or FreeBSD or Mac, services are pretty much, uh, every operating system has services that perform tasks in the background. Content provider. A content provider gathers external shared application data. So let's say you have a bunch of GPS software on your phone. You don't want to reinvent the wheel for every GPS application. You know, a, a GPS, uh, GPS coordinates basically are a low-level function that are provided by a content provider. So if you have four different GPS apps in your phone, each one of them can tap into that content provider to get the GPS, um, you know, the address coordinate types, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, broadcast receiver receives system-wide announcements. Okay, so say your phone is 
shutting down because it's low on battery power, you know? So maybe the, all the apps on your phone want to close um, gracefully instead of just getting, you know, instead of just losing power and then getting killed because the power to the system went down. So if there's a broadcaster on the, on your phone that says, hey, power's uh, low, I'm going to shut down in 45 seconds, that's a generic broadcast message that, that's system-wide. So all the programs that are open at that time, I say, well, let's shut down gracefully. That's an example of how a broadcast receiver could be used. Okay, discuss the Android manifest file. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Every Android application must have one, an Android manifest file in its root directory. It must be named androidmanifest.xml. The manifest file contains essential information about the program, such as its name, activities, services, broadcast receivers, content providers, and permissions. An improperly written manifest file will prevent an Android program from running. Okay, discuss the Eclipse IDE. In the demo that I'll do for you today, I'll actually show you Eclipse and I'll show you the Android development tool. Eclipse is a very popular integrated development environment that supports many programming languages and has many plugins. It's probably the most popular IDE for Java and Android programming. It has an ADT Android de development uh, tool plugin that allows developing Android apps directly from within Eclipse. And I'll kind of de demonstrate you, uh, that for you today. Okay, and finally we discussed the Android development tool. It's available as a standalone tool or as a plugin for Eclipse. And I'll demonstrate uh, both Eclipse and the Android development tool. And let me just jump ahead to the next slide to see what the next one is. Okay, we'll also demonstrate the and Android development tools in Eclipse. We'll show solutions to various errors. So uh, I ran into a couple of errors when I was setting up my Android development environment in Fedora 17. The first one was ADT wasn't showing up properly in Eclipse. And then I also got an error message when I tried to re re uh, run the Android device simulator. Uh, the message was NAND could not create a temporary file for the system NAND this image permission denied. I'll, I'll show you how to solve both problems. But let me talk about what that, that error message means. Okay, so the way it works is when you create an Android virtual device, uh, one of the options that you have is to set how much um, storage space that device has. You know, that, that, that virtual device has an SD card installed. So I can say that SD card is like 500 meg or 1 gig or 2 gig. Well, it has to temporarily write that to a file because, of course, that, that SD card doesn't exist in real life. It's just a virtual file on your computer system. Um, when I first tried to run the Android device simulator, it didn't have write access to the directory where it was trying to create that space to simulate that, um, that SD card. So I had to solve that problem. So let me jump ahead here and see what the next slide is supposed to be. Okay, so I'll demonstrate this, but let's kind of go through what I had to do to solve the first uh, ADT not showing up in the clip problem. And it took me hours. I mean, I'm making it really short here, but I, I basically started trying to get the environment set up on my Fedora 17 system to uh, develop Android apps uh, yesterday. So for the last uh, 24 hours, I've been dealing with a pretty bad problem and I couldn't get it running properly. So uh, after trial and error, what ended up working for me is I ended up having to uninstall Eclipse. I had to go to my home directory and select uh, view hidden files. I had to delete the, the dot Eclipse dot Android and workspace folders. I then reinstalled Eclipse and installed the Android ADT plugin and then everything worked for me. And I'll kind of demonstrate that real quickly. Um, and then the big error message I got up top, what I had to do was I had to close my AVD manager, which is uh, manages my Android virtual devices. I had to become a root user, and I deleted the temporary Android file by issuing the rm-r uh, command on that file, and I'll show you that, how we do that. Okay, and then finally when we get done with the demonstration, we'll go over a review of all of our topics. Okay, so let me kind of walk through... Um, you know, starting from scratch, that's the most painful thing, is how do you get uh, an Android development environment installed on a, on a GNU Linux system? And, and Linux is notoriously hard for doing stuff like this. So let me show you where I started. Um, so really quick, what I did was I just did a Google search. I did a Google search for Android SDK. So I have it set up on my computer where this search box is a Google box. So that takes you to developers. Uh, dot android.com. So that's where you want to start. If you really want to learn a lot about Android, this Android developer so site has a bunch of information, development guides, references, and this is kind of where I started and I had to read through this stuff for hours. You know, So hopefully this tutorial will make things a lot shorter for you. Now, when you start here, your first temptation is going to be to download 
one of these Android SDKs. So I looked at it here and I had Linux i386. Now I have a 64-bit a system, so this actually is not the 100% correct solution for me because, you know, ideally I'd like to have a 64-bit one, not a 386. That's a 32-bit system. So the first time I tried this, I downloaded this and I followed the instructions here. And that kind of works, but I'm going to show you a lot easier way of doing it. So let's go ahead and not walk through this, but let me just go ahead and show you how you would install Eclipse on a Linux system. So the first thing I would do is I would go, and again, a Fedora 17. So I'm going to my desktop here. I go to System Tools, and I go to Terminal. And then I have to become a root user. So let me make this big so you can see everything maximize. I'm going to issue the SU command, and then I'll type in my root password. Okay, then I'm going to use yum to install the, the Eclipse uh, IDE. So the, the, the command you're going to issue is yum install eclipse.jdt and hit enter. Now it's already installed for me, so it's going to tell me that it's already installed, but that's basically what you're going to do. Okay, so it says for me that Eclipse JDT 4.2 is already installed, and it's the latest version if nothing else to do. Okay, now the second thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to uh, set up to run the, the Android device emulator. Now, as you saw before when I showed you this uh, page here, this is a 32-bit program, right? So if you're running a 64-bit system like I am, which most modern computers are 64-bit system, my laptop is a, a satellite L675. So if you're running a 64-bit computer, um, now, just because you have a 64-bit computer doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're running a 64-bit operating system. The 32-bit version of Fedora will run on a 64-bit system. So 95% of you with a 64-bit with a laptop probably have the 64-bit um, version of your OS installed. You know, you need to verify that to make sure. So if you have a 64-bit uh, version of your operating system installed, you're going to have to do an additional step. So I'm going to show you how to find that. So what I did is I did another search for um, something like this. I'm like Android develop Fedora. Let's see where's the part. Yeah, there you go. So the first one that came up is how to set up Android development, and that's a, actually a FedoraProject.org org website. So if you're taking notes, uh, the site is FedoraProject.org forward slash wiki forward slash how to underscore setup underscore Android development. Very good tutorial that almost had it all right. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's probably about 90, probably 95% right. Um, so this one really led me in the right direction. So these are the 32-bit packages that you have to install to get it working on a 64-bit system. So all I did was I went and I copied this command here. And it's a yum install uh, the glibc, which is a C standard library. Uh, development and you see C++ library Zlib doesn't matter you know the details don't matter what what matters is, is that this gets uh, the Android device emulator working on a 64-bit system so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm just gonna edit and paste now again all of these are already installed on my system so it's just gonna tell me that all of this is installed let's run it okay but on your system if you don't have these installed it'll actually go install them so it's one two three four five, six, seven, eight packages, okay? All right, so now let's assume that I actually didn't have this installed. So now I've got Eclipse installed. I've got all my um, packages installed that allow uh, Eclipse to support my 32-bit uh, Google uh, Android um, emulator program, for lack of a better term, Android device emulator. All right, and I think that that was all that I had to install because I had OpenJDK installed already, okay? So now let's go ahead and open up Eclipse. So I have it right here. Uh, I don't know if Eclipse comes in under programming. No, it doesn't. Oh, okay, so we'll just do it from all. So there's Eclipse. Let's go ahead and click on that and start that. Eclipse is a pretty sweet looking program too. You see how, how beautiful the uh, desktop is there. So here's Eclipse, how Eclipse should look after everything is installed and working correctly. So let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at the Java environment. 
So if you go to, um, uh, let me see if I can find it, window, preferences, you should have a Java tab here. And later on, you'll have an Android tab. You haven't installed the stuff yet to get the Android tab yet. So if you just do what I just did, all you'll have is a Java tab. And what I want to do, what, I, what I'd like you to do is click on that Java, you know, expand that so you can see what's in here, and then go to the installed GREs. That stands for Java Runtime Environment. You should have Java, uh, depending on when you watch this, might be a different version, but 1.70 for me, 1.7.0. Open JDK. Make sure that it's the Open JDK version. I, I, I see no reason to install the Oracle JDK because the Open JDK, which is open source, has worked for me fine. So right now, you should have the Java Open JDK installed. Okay. All right. So now, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to get this Android development tool installed. So the way you do that is from within Eclipse, you're gonna go to um, Help install new software okay and then what you're gonna go you're gonna click on the add button and then you can call this anything you want to but uh, in the tutorial I found they, they say ADT plugin which stands for Android development tool plugin okay and then you have to put an address in here now the address I'll show you that really fast let's go back into Google and go back to that tutorial so the address you're going to type in is this address right here. Okay, there it is. That HTTPS address colon forward slash forward slash DL dash SSL dot Google dot com forward slash Android forward slash Eclipse. So let's copy that address in here. Now I already have this installed, so I won't actually do it, but I'll show you. Uh, how to do it. Okay, so here we're back in Android, so we're going to put that in here, Control V, and then you'll hit OK. Now, once you hit OK, what it'll do is it'll open up a bunch of different uh, repositories from which you can install. So I'm not going to hit OK, but you'll hit OK, and then you'll get something that looks like this. So let's go ahead and escape out of this, and I'll show you what I have installed. So I'm going to go back into install new software, and I'm going to show installed software. Okay, so here's what you're going to install. You're going to inst install the Android DDMS, which is the Dalvik deb uh, Debug Monitor Service. Dalvik is the Android is the virtual machine that Google created for Android. Uh, you remember we talked about the fact that you know you have virtual machines that actually run your code. Um, Dalvik is a, is a is a virtual machine for Android. Okay, Android Development Tools, Android Hierarchy Viewer, Android Trace View. And so as not to not to confuse you, let me go ahead and go ahead and do it. Let me uh, let me just walk through. So let's go ahead and paste it in here because I think it'll it'll just tell me that everything's already installed. So uh, ADT plugin, and then hit OK, and then you'll see this. This will come up. So now it knows where the repository where you download the software from. So there you go. So what you'll do is you just check everything, and you'll hit next. And it'll it's connected to the server. Okay, now it says ignore because all of this stuff is already installed on my system. So can I repeat request Android DDMS will be ignored? All this stuff's already installed. But for you, that won't be the case. We'll actually go through and install all this stuff when you hit finish, and then you'll be done. And then what you'll do is you'll go ahead and restart uh, Eclipse. It'll prompt you to restart automatically. So let's just go ahead and do it. Okay, now when you restart it, um, a couple of things should show up. So if you go to your window, you should have your Android SDK manager, and you should have your AVD manager. Now what happened to me the first time I did this is everything in the install seemed to work fine, but these didn't show up. Okay, so that was a big problem. So the next thing I looked at was I looked at File, New, and Project. If everything is installed correctly, when you hit new project, there should be an Android folder in there. There was no Android folder for me. So how did I fix that? And what was the problem? The root cause of the problem 
was that something in my settings, because I, I tried installing it multiple times, and somewhere something broke. The very first time I installed it, everything here was fine, but I kept on trying to play and install more stuff, and eventually somehow I broke it. And I tried everything. I tried uninstalling the clips. I tried uninstalling uh, OpenJDK, reinstalling. I did it multiple times. And every time it would come back, the error was still there. So I'm like, you know, I've, I've deleted everything. I've uninstalled everything. There's no reason this error should be coming back. It turned out that if, if you go into, um, you know, go into, uh, go into the desktop, go into activities, and then click on files. And this is an interesting thing. This is something I knew about Linux but it's something that kind of got refreshed in my head today. So right now, I'm, I'm in my home directory, okay? If you want to go to this, like specifically where I am, I'm in home and my username, rjerry. Home forward slash my username, rjerry. So let's, let's go into the file system, and I'll show you exactly where I am. So if you go into the, the root file system, this is this is my hard drive, you know? I have a home directory, and if I go inside home, there's all the users on the system. I'm the only user on the system, rjerry. All right, now, right now, this isn't showing me all of the files. There's hidden files in here. So let me go view, show hidden files, okay? So let's make this full screen so you can, have, you can really see what's, uh, well, let me make it full screen. Uh, let me just scroll over a little bit, all right? So the file that was causing the problem, and I think it was actually a couple of files, but at a minimum, it was this one. Uh, where is it? Eclipse, dot eclipse. Now, all the dot files are hidden. You can't see them unless you select view hidden files. So if you go in here, this has a lot of the metadata and a lot of the plugin information, you know, what's installed in the Eclipse folder. So what was happening was I was uninstalling Eclipse, but all the settings for Eclipse were still here. Another file that I think might have been causing problems is this dot Android file. So you notice that this has settings for AVD. Well, something in there was probably wasn't right. So what I did was after uninstalling and reinstalling the clips multiple times, I finally went in here and I just deleted the andro the dot Android file and the dot Eclipse file. Just make sure you don't have anything important in them, which you shouldn't if you just installed it, you know, before you delete them. I don't want you to get rid of any useful information. The other file I deleted is a file called um, uh, Workspace. This is a file that Eclipse generated the first time that I opened Eclipse. So, you know, just because there might be some settings in there that, you know, set dot met metadata, there's some settings there that, that could be confusing anything, or that could have been confusing something. I went ahead and deleted that file also. And then I, um, now before I deleted all these files, I uninstalled the clips. And then I deleted these files, and then I reinstalled the clips, and then I reinstalled uh, Google ADT, and everything worked beautifully. So if you, if you get stuck, and for some reason you come in here, and you've installed the ADT using the instructions, and it doesn't show up, you know, Android SDK Manager and AVD, AVD Manager don't show up, and you also don't have the option of uh, using an Android project pro uh, project or creating an Android project, that's probably the problem. So once I deleted those files and reinstalled Eclipse, uh, everything worked fine. I went in here into the ADT install again, using the install new software, you know, I plugged in the website here, and then everything worked fine. I, I had everything I needed. So now let's demonstrate um, ADT. All right, so first of, first, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demonstrate it by itself. So, uh, and I explain kind of how ADT works. Now, you remember when I went to the website before and I said you could download it and that actually kind of works. Well, what that does is all of my downloads go to, into my download folder. If you download ADT uh, from the Google website, you'll download it as a zip file. And I don't think this is actually the right file, but you'll download it as a, um, it's actually a 7Z file. Let me see if I can pull it up really fast again. So let's go to um, uh, Eclipse ADT plugin. Okay, ADT plugin. Okay, so here's the ADT plugin, and they have instructions for you uh, installing it. There's also another one. Let me see if I can find it. Android ADT. Okay, that's the same site.
I don't think I want to waste time with this because I ended up not using this method anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But basically, the first time I tried it, I had a file here, and I uncompressed it. So that's the ADT 18.0.0 file. And then what I did was I moved it into my home directory, and uh, I tried to set it up that way. Well, you don't need to do that because, like I showed you, it works. So what I what I what I finally ended up doing is when I installed ADT, it asked me where I want to put my ADT folder, and I decided to name it Android. Dot, uh, I'm sorry, Android SDK. You know, uh, by default, I think it was named Android dash something dash something, but this is fine. So if you look in the Android SDK folder for me, it has you know tools, platform tools, add-ons. And one of the platform tools that's very powerful, uh, there's actually a tool in here called Android. Let me see if I can find where it is. Uh, it might be in Tools. There it is, Tools Android. So uh, when you install it, what it'll do is it'll actually install this file in your path. So you don't have to type in the full address of a program to run it. And I'll show you exactly what that means. So. Once I installed this using, um, once I installed the ADT plugin for Eclipse, it actually did something pretty nice for me. So let me go view hidden files again, and let me show you my Bash profile. So if you go here, Bash profile, that's my user profile uh, within my home directory. All right, see these lines here? Okay, here's my normal path. My path is home uh, and home forward slash bin okay so those are those are those are those are both in my path where I don't have to type in an entire command to get something in that path it's already in my path well here's what I added um, now installing the ADT pl plugin will do this for you automatically anyway but when I tr when I tried to install it manually I had to go in here and add these paths in here to get the manual version working you shouldn't have to do that. It should just work. But in case you, you run into some trouble where for some reason you can't run it, this might be something that you have to do. So uh, so my path, uh, I added Android SDK to my path, and I added, I added Android SDK forward slash tools to my path. And then uh, for SDK release 8 and higher, all right, add this for ADB, ADB support. ADB, if I remember correctly, is the uh, Android debugger. So the path of that is uh, Android um, SDK forward slash platform tools. All right, so that's just a heads up. You know, if you run into that problem, that might be something that you have to kind of research and look at. Um, I think that if I hadn't added these manually to my Bash profile, I think it would have worked fine. I think that um, the plugin would have added them automatically because, like I said, the very first time I installed the plugin, it worked. It was just after I played and broke it that I had to, you know, I feel like I finally figured out how to uninstall it and get it working. So the next thing I want to do is I want to kind of demonstrate um, running the Android uh, development tool from the command line for you. So let's go Applications, and we're going to go System Tools, and we'll go Terminal. And I can run it either as a root user or non-root user. So let me go Exit, so become a regular user again. So now I'm R Jerry. So run Android. And that's why you add it to your path. If you don't add it to your path, you've got to type in that full path to that Android executable that I just showed you. Since this is my path, all I have to do is type in the word Android. And there it is. There's your Android development tool. Uh, and I guess Android SDK, it actually stands for Android Standard Development Kit. So the very first time I ran this, some of this stuff wasn't installed. So what I did was I just installed the stuff that made sense. So tools, I need both of these. And if you actually go on the Android developer's website, it recommends, you know, based on whatever you're doing, that you get these. So I checked all of these. Uh, Android 4.03 API 15. That's the latest API as of when I'm, I'm doing this tutorial. So I definitely wanted the Android uh, 4.03 stuff. Now some of the stuff in here actually... Uh, I couldn't install um, OpenSense. I really don't care about it. Maybe I'll install it later. Um, you know, I could have installed that, but um, you know, I, I, I don't. I'm not really interested in just developing for one manufacturer's platform right now. HTC OpenSense is a kind of an open implementation of its Sense UI uh, that it has. 
I'm I'm more interested in developing generic apps that'll run on like every Android platform. So you know every Android device. So I didn't install that now. Ice Cream Sandwich R1. It seems like that's a Motorola thing. So when I check that, for me to actually install it, I have to uh, you know put in a username and password as a Motorola developer. I said no, screw that. I'm not doing that. So I didn't do that one. But you know pretty much all the all all the other stuff in here made sense. Yeah, documentation. I like to read a lot, so <laughs> you know when I run into problems, I like to have documentation. So I said, let me do the documentation. SDK platform that made sense. Samples, you know, in case I run into problems, I can look at some samples. You know, I definitely want to uh, develop apps for ARM and Intel, so I install both of those. Google API, you know, Google is the is the is the maker of Android, so to me, Google API makes sense because you know eventually I might want to write apps that talk to Google apps like you know Google uh, Maps. So to do that, you'll need Google API. So that made sense to me. That's how I think about it. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Sources for Android SDK. Yeah, I'm a guy that likes to see source code. So that might, you know, most likely I'll never look at it. But, you know, just in case, it's nice to have it there. And then I pretty much decided that I'm not going to try to support older Android platforms. You know, that might be a dumb idea because most of the Android users out there are still running older versions of Android. But I would really rather... Me personally, I'd rather write for the the latest and greatest, and then I hope that you know eventually, the market share for the latest and greatest will be the highest. You know, Windows Seven starts out pretty low, but over time it eventually ends up being the majority of it. So I figure if I write apps geared towards Android 4.03, eventually the market will come to meet me. You know, um, but if you want to develop for older Android platforms, you, know, you can download all of that here. And then the extras, the extras are stuff that I might look at in the future, but for right now, you know, Android support, uh, that's probably one I actually should install, but whatever. Uh, you know, most of these are advertising and things like that, and those are things that I'm not really looking at at the moment, you know. Uh, the USB driver is not compatible with Linux. The Intel hardware acceleration is not compatible with Linux. Okay, so what I just demonstrated for you is the Android SDK running it from the command line, not from within Eclipse. The, the second kind of cool tool I can do from here is I can actually start uh, a simulator. So let me just do one from scratch. Let's delete this one. Okay, and let's create a new one. So I'm just I'm just gonna call it. Uh, what is what the, what it's actually doing is it's simulating a phone, an Android phone. So let me just call it my phone. And the target will be, let's just say, uh, Android 4.03 API. CPU, let's say it has an ARM CPU. And let's say it has a 500 megabyte SD card. Uh, and the screen resolution, let's just say, yeah, WVGA uh, 800, that's fine. And then create AVD. Okay, so now the AVD has been created. Okay, now let's go ahead and start it. So we'll hit start. Uh, scale display to real size. Uh, I'm going to check that now. Let's go launch and just see what happens. Now this is pretty cool. The first time I saw that, I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm just a fraction of a step from actually, uh, 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 you know, writing my first Android app. So here we go. So we have a simulated Android phone starting up. It takes a very long time to start up because, as you can imagine, my computer, which is only... Uh, uh, it's, it's a dual core, you know, maybe like two gigahertz somewhere around there. And it's sitting here trying to emulate a machine that's, you know, probably more than one gigahertz itself. So, um, you know, it, it, it's run, it runs pretty smooth. Like once it actually comes up, I won't wait for it to come up because it, it takes forever. Uh, but once it comes up, it um, it's pretty slow, you know. I, I actually tried to surf the internet on it. <laughs> and a web page, you know, takes like a few seconds to load. It's, it's really cumbersome. So... If you want to if you want to develop Android apps using the emulator, you know you, you want to do it on a pretty fast system because the Android device will take you know quite a bit of resources in your system. Um, probably it, it's probably better to do it on a really powerful desktop system than on a laptop like, like I'm doing. But you know, uh, what am I going to do? You know, you, you use whatever you have available to you. All right, I wish I, I wish I could wait and actually show you the desktop. Let me let me just let it uh, run for a few seconds. And let me see if I can actually show you the desktop here. And then the next part of this lecture, what I'll do is I'll actually open the same thing from within um, Eclipse. You know, it pretty much looked the same. And uh, I'll show you that, and then we'll close this out. Actually, it looks like it's ready to come up here. 
Okay, print the print SD card. Okay, let's give it a couple of seconds here. And hopefully it doesn't crash. There was one time I ran it where it actually crashed. And uh, I don't like the way it's looking right now because the Android, um, you know, the little reflection on top of the Android isn't coming up anymore, so it might have already crashed. Let's see, the button still works, yeah. Yeah, this happened to be before. So what we might do is I'll just close this one out, and then we'll do it from within um, Eclipse. All right, so that's, that was just a quick demonstration of uh, running the Android SDK manager from the command line. Let's go ahead and close that out. Close terminal. Okay, so I close that. And we can close this. Okay, so now from within Eclipse, I can do the exact same thing. So within Eclipse, I would just go uh, Window and Android SDK Manager, or you could go straight to the uh, ABD Manager. But let me open up the SDK Manager, show you it looks exactly the same. So there we go, it's the exact same thing again. All right. And it's the same SDK Manager, so it's, it's going to be the same stuff installed. You know, just you want to run it from within Eclipse, or do you want to run it from within? Um, from the command line. And to, to close it, you just hit escape. All right, now the AVD manager, same way you come in here, hit AVD manager. Now the same, it's the same AVD, AVD manager, it's running from the same place. That folder that I showed you before, um, normally in your home directory, you can name it whatever you want to. I chose to name it Android SDK. It's all running from the same folder. So the same stuff that you have created in one will show up in the other one. So again, I would just hit start. Uh, and you can, you know, choose whatever information you want. Hit launch, and there it goes again. I wish there was a way to speed it up, you know, <laughs> to make it uh, come up faster. But let's see if we can. I don't think I can do anything else while it's doing that. Okay. Nope, I'm stuck. So until this comes up, I can't do anything. I, I would like it to actually get to the, you know, to the, to the, to the desktop so you can actually see it. So let me just give it a few more seconds here. Hopefully it doesn't crash this time. Um, I, you know, while I'm waiting for this to come up, I did play with. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Look how beautiful it is. All right. So when 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 it comes up here, you notice that it looks just like a, a standard ice cream sandwich. Um, desktop kind of a generic one uh, I have an HTC vivid and mine looks a lot different because um, HTC had that open sense that I was talking about they have that kind of layer on top of Android so um, but I can actually go in here with my mouse and I can unlock it oh, let me see there we go okay so there's my desktop right there there's the camera and then this is like assuming that I'm logging onto it for the first time, so it gives me all these, you know, kind of nude messages. So we'll hit OK on that. Okay, let's see all of our apps. Okay, so there you can see. I'm not going to do it right now because it's, it's painfully slow, but uh, to add an app into your circle, touch and hold it. Okay, I don't want to do that, so let's hit OK. Okay, but the first time I did this, I actually played with some of these apps. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's painfully slow because it's emulated on a, on not the fastest system in the world. So, um, you know, but I clicked on the browser. I was able to actually browse web pages. So it's, it's pretty cool. All right, so that's a, you know, a quick demo of that. So let's go ahead and close this out. Let's go ahead and close this out. And let's go ahead and go back to the lecture here. Okay, so a quick review of the learning objectives. We discussed Android and Java. We discussed Open S, um, Open JDK. We discussed Android APK files. We discussed the Android Security Sandbox. We discussed Android Application Components. We discussed the Android Manifest file. And we had a really fun demonstration of the Android development tools. And we also demonstrated uh, 
Eclipse. And then we showed how to solve a couple of inst installation problems I had during my own install. Oh, thank you very much for watching this. This was a really fun lecture to do. I'm really looking forward to actually doing the Android tutorial where we actually go through and write some applications. If you want to review this, the write-up for this lecture is at jerry.com forward slash node forward slash 28. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day.